Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Cutting Room in New York City. I'm Brad Talinsky with Backstory Events. And tonight's show is going to be live streamed on guitarworld.com. So behave yourself. Uh, upcoming Backstory Conversations include uh, an evening with the zombies. Yeah. Gonna be terrific. And uh, we're gonna be doing something with the Almond Betts Band, which is the sons of the legends, Greg Allman and Dickie Betts. But tonight on our stage, this evening, we have really one of the most magnificent voices in the history of rock and one of the great songwriters. And he's with us to talk about his fantastic new solo record that you've been enjoying, 1,000 Hands. And we're going to talk a little bit about Yes, and then later he's going to play a couple of songs, which is going to be amazing. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Anderson. We'll get somebody to bring a table up here. Hello there. Yeah. Now sit down here. Yes, sir. Oh my gosh, how are we doing? <laughs> What's the difference between a, a man who falls from a seven story building and a man who falls from a one-story building, same building. Line. Yeah. yeah. The guy who falls from the seven-story building goes, ah, <laughs> And the guy who stole, falls from the first story goes, ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. I've already, you know. <laughs> oh, life. The horse went in the bar and the guy says, why the long face? <laughs> you've heard them all, you've heard them all. Sorry. So. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we take detours here, it's all good. Um, so congratulations on uh, 1,000 Hands, Thank fantastic you. record. Now, this record is rumored to have taken, it's been 30 years in the making. Can well, you tell us a little bit about the uh, evolution of this thing? Sure. Um, you know, 30 years ago, 29 years ago, I, I, I found myself in Big Bear, which is the mountains near LA, and the lake of Big Bear, and uh, I went up there to get away from the world, and I just needed a break, you know. So I rented an A-frame, and I took my 12-track TIAC recording machine with me, and I've been writing songs with a friend of mine called Brian Chatton, who uh, was in a band called The Warriors, which was my first band. Yeah. Yes, and uh, <laughs> he joined the band when he was 16, and we kept friends forever sort of thing. And you he's know. crazy. Oh, damn right. I, I never laughed as much in my life that time. I, I had the best, best time. Anyway, I, I remember uh, arriving at Big Bear, and, you know, I just wanted to go and have a drink. <laughs> That's basically, I went to the local bar and uh, ordered some tequila. And, uh, and there was a couple of guys singing on this little stage. There was nobody in the bar. And uh, they were singing eel, eagle songs and such. And uh, so I enjoyed them. So I waved them over afterwards. They finished and uh, said, come and sit down and I'll buy you a drink. And we sat and talked. I said, I've just rented this A-frame, so it'd be great if you guys could come and play in my place every Tuesday, we'll write some songs. And uh, so I said to them, and they, say, they said, uh, you're John Anderson, are you? I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 well, of course we're gonna, of course we're gonna come and make music with you, you know? And I said, is this what you do every night? He said, no, no, we run the ski resort. And so I met this guy, John Rice, and his friend, Tim. And uh, the following day, I was on the slopes they gave me the skis and the outfit and everything, and I love skiing anyway. So every morning I'd go skiing, and it sort of woke me up emotionally and mentally. And so I started writing a lot of songs, 
and uh, I had a couple of friends in LA and I invited them up to stay in my A-frame little house and we recorded about, I think, six songs uh, that we really liked. And I kept saying, I w want to call it us lot, which uh, in north of England means a lot of us. Because I, I want to have guest artists on the, on the record. And I kept thinking of uh, people that I would love to be on the record. And I thought of, uh, you know, Billy Cobham, one of the great drummers. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <clears throat> and, uh, Ian Anderson, what an incredible guy, you know? And uh, of course, uh, Chris uh, Squire and Alan White were down in LA. So we went down to LA and got on to play on a track uh, called Activate Me. And uh, then things happen, you know, life happens. And uh, we never got around to finishing it because I went on tour with Kitaro for a couple of months. And uh, that was real fun. And uh, Brian went and I had a crazy time somewhere else. <laughs> I want to have a drink, sorry. Well, you said that uh, putting, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, carry on, please. Uh, I was gonna say, you said that this uh, record is one of the best sort of musical experiences you had, does that yeah. play into it? I think, well, well the, the fact was that I, 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 I finished up with the tapes. I had about 12, uh, 24 tracks, pretty big four inch, reel-to-reel -reel tapes in my garage for 20 years. And then somebody got in touch with me. It was a producer guy called um, Michael Franklin. Can you turn the mic up in the monitor, please? And then I can hear myself a little bit. Michael Franklin has a studio in Orlando. And he said, uh, well, send me the tapes and we'll work on them. You know, I said, okay, cool. Thinking, that's 20 years later, this is, you know, 24 years later. So what you have to do with the uh, 24 tracks, which are pretty big. You put them in an oven and you bake them. It's true. It's true. And then you put some yeah. icing on. What? No, no, no you don't. <laughs> <coughs> you bake them and then you can play them just one more time. And uh, they, you put them straight into the computer, all the music straight into the computer. And it actually worked. And, and all the music sounded incredibly good. I was very surprised. And then I remembered the songs and uh, thought, uh, well, Michael Franklin is going to start working on it, you know, and his, his brother Tim, who's a beautiful bass player, uh, started working on it, and the engineer turned out to be a great drummer, and Michael Franklin himself was a really good keyboard player, so when I went to see them, after they'd done some recordings, I said, we could be a band, you know, because we're, we're pretty good, it's, we're sounding good, you know, and then he started inviting all these people on to perform, the first guy he got was Billy Cobham, and it kind of freaked me out because the, the track that he played on was one you might have heard, it's called uh, Come Up, and uh, the music always sounded pretty good. Then they put a really good drummer on it and it opened up like a beautiful flower, it was just amazing. And then uh, Chick Corea played on it, and uh, unbelievable. This guy walks in and just plays on the damn thing, it's like there's no tomorrow. And then I asked Jean-Luc, who was living in Paris at the time, and he put some beautiful violin. So all these people over the years, you know, that I've bumped into and performed with and, and loved, uh, have come and played on this album. And it's, it's at my time of life. <laughs> it's a wonderful moment. That's all there is to it. Um, you've said that you feel like now in this this time of your life, some of the real good stuff is, is coming through. Yeah, I keep saying that. You know, people say, what are, you, what are you thinking now? I say, well, the great music is coming. That's what I think. And it'd be stupid if I just said, well, I'm gonna make an album. It's not gonna be as good as, you know. <laughs> What's the point? You're always going thinking you're gonna do something really great. You know, it's a normal energy that you're a musician. You gotta go in and do it, make it work and touch a lot of people. And uh, I'm very blessed. I'm very grateful to be able to do what I do, so. Yeah. Well, Ivan, I'm sure everybody here has sort of really enjoyed the <coughs> transcendental sort of nature of your music and, uh, and lyrics, you know, sort of uplifting feel. And there's a great song on, on the new record, you guys probably heard a little bit of it coming in, called Ramalama, and I'd like to 
I'd like to have us listen to a little bit and then maybe talk to how this song came okay. about. Yeah, I'll mime to it because I'm still learning it. Because you know? <laughs> I did it a couple of years ago. Uh, it's one of those things. I like actually going in the studio in my, in my cottage and I'll, I'll do morning exercise vocally. My, I'm just, just doing this thing that uh, the pygmies do in, in the Congo in Western Africa where they go out hunting and, and fishing and looking for food and they're always going like that. And I love doing that, you know, it's like, I wake up and I just get into that. So you'll hear it when I start to the track, when they start playing the track. Rama Lama. Yeah. Well, Gerard? If he has a story, you don't have to, oh, there I am. Um, that was just it. a little taste of that song, too. I mean, it, it yeah. goes to all sorts of incredible places yeah. afterwards. Actually, the, the music for it was done by the producer, uh, Michael Franklin, when he was on a plane to China. He actually just did all the sounds on the computer. It's kind of amazing it's what you can do these days, you know. You mentioned sort of where you got the uh, musical riff from, you know, this... From, from the pygmies, sort of that sure. idea, but where, yeah. where did the lyrics for this come from? Oh boy. I think, you know, I, I write lyrics as they come through, you know, just, uh, in fact, what I do, I, I, I learned this when I worked with Vangelis quite a lot, that you sing something and you, you sing it with a sort of natural feel for some reason, you just do it as a natural event. And then if you listen closely, you can hear what you're singing about. And I'll, I'll write down exactly what I was thinking, what I'm singing about. Some words just pop out very clear, but uh, that's the way it works. You know, some, uh, some people have a different way of doing things, but I, I just write the lyrics as they come, you know. Do you listen to much, because uh, it's sort of interesting, there's sort of like a dubstep break in the middle of this whole thing. Do you listen to much contemporary music, electronic music? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. All kinds of music, and, and sort of mesmerized by the, the all different kinds of music. Uh, I was actually blown away by uh, This Is America. Do you ever see that video, This Is America? <clears throat> the bass on that is amazing. And the words, of course, but just the, the production is amazing. That's why it won a Grammy, I think. It won a Grammy, something like that. So you mentioned, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, uh, sort of the title track of the album, it, it, 1,000 Hands subtitle, move, move Up, that's... Come Up. Come Up, I'm yeah. sorry. That's all right. Um, and, uh, I mean, there are all these incredible players on it. I mean, you have Chick Corea, you have Billy Cobham, you have yeah. Jean-Luc Ponty. Yeah. It's sort of an all-star group of, of fusion Super jazz group. people. Yes. yes, of course. Has jazz had an impact or that particular era of fusion? Uh, I think you know? it's just part of, you know, as you grow in, into where you're going musically. I remember listening to jazz when I was like very young, you know, in the, in the 50s, 60s. And just generally, 
uh, people like Rasang Roland Kirk and uh, Charlie Mingus and people like that. This just blow my mind. What are they do? How do they do that? You know. Mm -hmm. And then you bump into them and you meet them and you realize they're, they're musicians and they just have a different way of expressing through their style of music and uh, the same with rap, the same with the opera, all sorts of music. So as you, as you get older, for me, I was just uh, embracing all different kinds of music and I still am. I just feel like I'm just touching the surface of new musical ideas and new musical dreams, and, uh, which is a great feeling, very, very honestly. Um, on this record, uh, some of your guests, you have three of the perhaps most uh, respected electric violinists uh, in the world. You have Robbie Steinhardt from Kansas, and yeah, yeah. Jean-Luc Ponty, and Jerry Goodman, who played Ma Vishnu yeah, and the Charlie, Dixie Dress. Charlie Bicharat, who played on um, another song. I'm trying to remember the song now. Charlie Bicharat, he played on um, that song. Yeah. <laughs> Um, does, does this particular instrument hold a special intrigue for you? Gosh, yeah. Um, I started writing uh, violin music a few years ago after listening to Sibelius' violin concerto a thousand times, wondering how the hell did this guy write this music? And he used, Sibelius was a violinist, and uh, Sibelius was a Finn, Finn, a Finnish person lived in Finland <laughs> and wrote some of the most glorious music, uh, symphonic music, and he's my musical god in many ways. So I listened to the violin concerto and then I, I, I remember I went out shopping to Walmart and came back thinking, <clears throat> I'll, get a, I'll get a great violin sound on the keyboard and I'll start being a violinist. And, and I, just, I just pretend to be a violin player and I wrote all this music and I've been working with a friend of mine who lives just south of LA and uh, doing a very special project called Violin Stories. So it's a natural connection for me when I met Jean-Luc Ponty. I just mesmerized how he can play the damn thing. Yeah. It's a very delicate instrument, of course, you know. Um, those of us who, um, you know, th those who uh, grew up on, on Yes and, and progressive rock, I mean, you know, Jethro Tull was also a huge band from that era, and you have Ian Anderson playing with you. This is sort of a, a dream con come true for prog rock freaks of having you guys play together. Yeah. Now, you, you've talked in the past about how much you enjoyed King Crimson, but was yeah. Jethro Tull so, sort of on that radar too, Them, those guys doing the long... Well, I, I saw Jethro Tull the first time in his club in London called The Speakeasy, and I just saw this guy looking like a tramp with a long raincoat. <laughs> Reminding me of somebody out of Oliver, you know, just play, playing away. I was mesmerized by him. And the same thing happened. Uh, King Crimson did their first show at the Speakeasy, uh, doing the whole first album. And I stood next to Chris. And I, after the first half of the show, I looked at Chris, because he's much taller than me. <laughs> Chris, we got to rehearse, man, because <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> That's how you feel. You feel mesmerized by a band that obviously worked so hard, like King Crimson did, to make that first album. And then we were lucky to go on tour in America with Jethro Tull. So I got to meet Ian, and uh, uh, again, watching him on stage then was amazing. He just had this incredible talent for dancing with his flute and singing and projecting and that first tour I, i'd stand there with my tambourine very shy you know. <laughs> but i watch him and uh, realize every night he was doing the similar thing so he he had a choreography of his stage show and it taught me a lot and i told him you know i said you, you're really helping me because i just don't want to stand there with the tambourine you know, so. mm. very grateful well, you just mentioned uh, Chris Squire, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, there's, uh, yeah. there's some tracks. It's you. I know it's you. Chris, Chris appears on this record. Yeah. And uh, I, I was sort of wondering, you know, it's been a few years since he's passed. I know you guys were, you started your careers together. Sure did, yeah. Um, you know, what did Chris Squire as a musician and as a person mean to you? 
ridiculous. As a bass player, one of the great bass players, very melodic, very, probably unique, very unique. He was a big fan of uh, uh, John Entwistle, but uh, he, he was musically, me melodically, very unique if you, if you listen to Yes Music, and I'm singing a certain phrase, and there he is climbing through it. And, and I listen now and again, and whenever I'm doing a Yes song with whoever, I want them to play the Chris Squire lines. It's very important because it, it balanced out the voice and the roots of the band, you know. And he was a crazy guy, you know, he was, it's true. Uh, you know, I, we, we all went to see Star Wars when it opened, and I said right away, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he, <laughs> and he said, Darth Vader. <laughs> so, that was our story, that was our story. We went through great, great times. And the, the one thing about Chris, no matter what, you know, he, he loved nightlife and going being a, a, a celebrity of rock and roll, whatever. But man, when he got on stage, he was there. He would never, ever mess around, especially rehearsing new music, new songs. I was thinking about a piece of music we did called uh, Mind Drive the other day. Yeah. So. It's an incredible piece of music. And it all started with uh, Alan and Chris. For about two hours, I said, can you, can you not change key? <laughs> okay. That's the way we were. But in many ways, he was also your singing partner, too. Gosh, yeah. Yeah, he was brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> No, nobody liked him. He was a unique musician and person, you know. Um, when, when, when you guys were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, yeah. I, thank you. Yes, that's what I said. About bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> I think afterwards people thought that maybe the classic lineup would get back together again. Do yeah. you think that dream is over? I mean, There'd do you see There'd be 20 that? of us on stage. It wouldn't work. You know? <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Who knows? You know, in this life, you never know. I was very happy. Um, we did the last piece of music of the album called Now and Again. And uh, we asked Steve, I asked Steve, would he mind playing some music on it? And he did. As soon as I heard it, I wanted to sing, because it's Steve, you know? So I sang the sort of homage to Steve and sang about our life together a little bit. So I felt really good that it, he ends the album. Very, very sweet. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, just earlier, you just said that part of the songwriting process is, is part of your process of understanding yourself, understanding what's going on and clarifying yeah, your own yeah, thoughts. Yeah. And I was wondering if we could just talk about a, a couple of songs from Yes. Please. And uh, try to find out sort of what that process is like. I've always been curious about your move, which is one of your... Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. most beloved songs. Yeah. It seems very, it's got the chess metaphor, but it also seemed very personal. Yeah, because uh, it's time in time, it's time in whatever I sing, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> with your time is captured, you know, it's, we're in time with the divine energy all the time. That was what it was, that's all it was. And the end was captured for the queen to use, but it's more about the rhythmic quality of cause it's time, it's time and time with your time, which means divine energy of whatever you want to call it is connected to you, so never forget that. And that was the song. You know, move me onto the squares, put me in not dangerous situations, but put me in where, wherever you think I need to go. Move me onto any square. Use me any time you want, which is what a, you know, it's, it's, called, it's called letting go and letting God, you know? It's a natural event, and it's nothing. <laughs> you know, I, I always find myself giving advice to my friends of, you know, don't surround yourself with yourself, sure. too, you know? Sure, 
Yeah. But we do. <laughs> uh, you know, don't get hung up on yourself, you know, because, you know, you're a child of God. It's true. When you remember when you were a child, and you were told you were children of God, and they're still children. You know, you can see it all day, every day, everywhere. We're all children still. We need to grow up on many levels, but we're still children. Ta da! <laughs> well, this one's a little more complicated, but um, I'm sort of wondering you know, especially after performing it for so many years, what close to the edge actually means. A season you. which can call you from the depths of your disgrace and rearrange your liver to the solid mental grace. And I remember writing out the reason I wrote those lyrics. A season which will call you from the depths of your disgrace. Your higher self will call you from the depths of your discomfort and rearrange your liver, rearrange your physical self to the solid mental grace and achieve it all with music that came quickly from afar and so on and so on and so on. You know, I thought, I think one day I will write the book of uh, how to sort out my lyrics. <laughs> you know, why not, why not, you know, why not? Well, I wonder, do you, do you like the idea of your lyrics being sort of more evocative, or do you want them to be understood? It's a balance. Um, there's a delicate area where you don't want to spell things out too much, because what for? You know, everybody knows, really. So why not dance around it with a more mystical sort of form of writing, or if you like, Starship Trooper, go sailing on by. You know, Sister Bluebird, another higher self mentioned, you know. Though you've seen me, please don't say a word. Because <laughs> I've still got to figure it out. Because though you've seen me, the divine sees me, sees us all. And though you see me, please don't say a word. What I don't know, I have never shared, you know. And that's the idea of things like that. They just pop in your mind and you just don't want to say what I just told you. Because it would sound kind of corny, you know. So you put it in a more poetic way, if you like, you know. And, uh, but then, <clears throat> now and again, uh, I just want to sing it. You know, uh, there's a song on the new album. It's dedicated to my beautiful wife, Jane, who really, as you know, rearranged my life mentally, emotionally, on so many levels. And the song is, I found myself when I found you. And that's true. Because without her, I wouldn't have found myself. I'm going to start crying. Because <laughs> I love her so much. And she sings with me on their song as well. And uh, it's just the way it is, you know. Now and again, you sing your true self, your true words. And uh, it's part of the game. It's sort of a wonderful game that you play with yourself, writing songs, lyrically, and waiting for the next one to come along that's going to challenge you, you know. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm going to just ask you about one more, and then we'll Please. move on. Uh, but uh, one of the most inspira inspirational pieces of sort of modern music, and we'd still call it pop or rock and roll, was True. Awakened from Going for the One. True, yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, it's almost like a psalm. It's, it's really... Beautiful. Could you talk about the origins of, of that song? Well, um, basically, we were on tour, and I was going for breakfast. We were in a Holiday Inn, and uh, I went past Steve's room, and there was a lot of smoke coming under the, under, the, <laughs> under the door, you know, and I could hear him playing. That's pretty cool. So I went for breakfast and I came back. So I opened the door and said, Steve, change the key. So I went in and I started singing. Which is a counter melody to his. And so we taped that and I said, 
for the next uh, stanza, how many chords can you play without uh, repeating yourself? And he said, oh, quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> so he started playing. And I said, okay, play them again. He started. I can't remember what I sang now. Um, da, da, da. What workings of man set to ply our historical life, re regaining the flower of the fruit of his tree, all awakening, all restoring you. And I actually wrote those lyrics right at that moment in the, on the cassette. Mm. It was like a spontaneous combustion of energy. And I'm like, oh my God, what are we doing here? And uh, by the time we went to record it in uh, Montreux, we got into a situation where we recorded um, Going for the One, which is, you know, got my guitar out and started singing the highest note I could find. <laughs> Stupid. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know. Uh, as time went along, my voice got higher and higher. And now I can sing like... Every time I answer the phone, it's, yes, ma'am, can I help you? <laughs> I've got a high voice, I'm actually a guy. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Anyway, um, we were recording um, the album Going for the One. And what was happening, thank you so much. And uh, Pat, Pat Maras, bless him, was never around when we were rehearsing. So it just felt like we were missing somebody. And then uh, Brian Lane, our manager at the time, said, uh, I hear you're doing very well with songwriting. And I said, yeah, we're just missing a keyboard player. He said, well, you know, Rick would love to rejoin the band. And I said, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> so Rick came back. And from that moment, it was the most joyous experience to make that album. And I remember um, some of the great moments, especially we, we got to a certain stanza, I call them stanzas, it's a section of, of uh, you know, Awaken. We got to a certain point, and I'd been playing the harp quite a lot and painting while they learned all the parts. Because <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be like a guy who'd say, okay, so now we're going to go to this part, guys. Okay, get on with it, and I get the paints out. And <laughs> And playing the harp, you know. And so it came to a certain point, where do we go from here? And I started just going, dun, 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 dun. Alan, have you got any bells that are in tune? He said, oh, I've got these croton bells. And I said, play, dun, 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 dun. And then Steve started do, doing, and it was a very spontaneous event, one afternoon. He started doing like steel guitar, like washes of music and things. And then Chris started coming in this beautiful, very simple bass line. And we all looked at Rick, and Rick started playing, you know, church organ. But it, it didn't sound as well as I thought it could sound. So I said to him, OK, what, what we should do, Rick, is find a church, <laughs> a real church organ. So we found one 10 miles away in a place called Veve. 10 miles away from the studio. And uh, Vevey was very well known because Charlie Chaplin lived there. And Charlie Chaplin's son kept coming to the, uh, the, the rehearsals and stuff. And he, he, invited, he invited us to go and meet Charlie Chaplin, but I was so afraid. You know, like, <laughs> it's okay, I'd rather not. Charlie Chaplin, you know. So me and Rick went to the church and uh, we actually did a, a couple of set early morning sessions where I'd be there in the cloisters uh, playing the harp with a microphone and some speakers, and then Rick would be on the church organ. And we got into this whole thing. We actually did about three days of just, just playing ideas. And then we started editing the ideas together to form the piece of music. And then we thought, now how are we going to do this? Because the sound of the organ is unique, especially this church organ. So the interesting thing about, uh, and probably a lot of you know the story, but a lot of uh, people don't know, but in Switzerland, the, the phone system is so pure and clear that you can plug into the phone system the, the little uh, mixer with the microphones on the organ into the mixer and the harp into the mixer, 
plug it into the phone lines and it goes straight to the studio. So they could hear us in the studio saying, Chris, oh, he hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> he, was always, he was always late. <laughs> well, Alan was there and Steve was there and we'd say, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, so very, very clear. So we're gonna start off, and so basically we recorded that whole section with, and then Chris arrived, of course. And uh, so we recorded that whole sec middle section, in, and we did it three times, about three times. And then we kept all the best parts, but we actually recorded it 10 miles from each other. It's like, now I make records with people in Switzerland and Scandinavia and never meet them. <laughs> it's true. Our, our, you know, MP3s to each other, you write music with people around the world. It's nothing. But in those days, unbelievable. So, uh, I remember coming home from that session, and we were driving home, uh, home back to the studio, and uh, Rick said, I'm going to write some choral, choral music for it, you know? And he got the local choir, and he wrote out all the music, and I remember sitting there listening to Awaken as it was being mixed and the, the choir started to come in and sing. And I thought, I'm in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it truly was. It was a magnificent event, musically. Just, and people would say to me, you know, how did you get to doing Awaken? I said, well, we had to go through Close to the Edge and then <laughs> Tales from... Topographic oceans, gates of delirium, awaken, <laughs> which is true. And that wasn't an easy, easy path to take, believe me. Drove me crazy. But eventually we got to awaken and the, and the enlightenment came like, boom, you know? And I know that when we perform it, something happens. It's really very powerful. Me too, thank you. <laughs> you know, the, the, the idea of, a, of the spiritual quest, you know, is, is actually popular in, you know, in, you, you see it in movies or in books, even in video games, but it's sort of gone out of music a little bit. Um, do you know, do you Not have any... Not for me. Yeah. <laughs> But in, 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 you know, in popular music, do you think it's just hard to strike that balance? Is it just a difficult thing to do? I, th I think the music is there, the, 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 the passion is there. When I watched uh, Gaga and that guy, I never remember his... But that guy. When I watched them on... on the, it was magic, you know? It yeah. was pure magic. And uh, that was the same thing. It's a very spiritual event. Right. It doesn't have to be all that stuff, you know. No, it's, it's, we are connected. We're spiritual beings, you know. I like to sing about it. <laughs> but we are. We are spiritual. Yeah, true. We are spiritual beings. We're indigenous pe beings, don't you know? I, we, we so forget. We're indigenous people. So why... why sorry, I'm going to get into a number here. Uh, why dis disassociate ourselves with Native Americans, you know, the indigenous people of this part of the world, until, until that is sorted out with our state of mind, America will not be great, I'm sorry. It will be, eventually, eventually, like Canada, you ask for forgiveness, like Australia, you ask for forgiveness for the genocide. And it's not easy, you know? I gotta put I gotta put that out because uh, you know we don't realize what's going on out there. You know, it's important to put it out there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, it'll all come to us in the next two or three years. It'll come to us very deeply. It's a natural event for us to ask for forgiveness for genocide to the people, the children, the millions of people. It's up to us. You know, we collectively will wake up. And I believe that very, very deeply, that we will wake up and dream. Duh. One of the great things about uh, 1,000 Hands is you, 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 you do have the, 
the sort of deepest, most spiritual feelings. But but sometimes the the best songs are also simple ones. And and sure. there's a great song on on this record called uh, "Makes Me Happy." I'd like Gerard to play maybe a little bit for us, and then yeah. talk Please. about how uh, something simple can be deep too. True. Turn it up, come on. Turn it up, come on. Last week with this uh, wonderful bunch of musicians in Orlando, and uh, I didn't know this was going to happen because one of the key, one of the keyboard players—we have two keyboard players—he's from uh, Philippines, and uh, we get into the song, and all of a sudden he picks up a trombone with a sax player. It sounds like a brass section, and I'm going, "My God, we're good!" <laughs> <laughs> and we we love what we're doing. We're really having a good time. And uh, thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll get there. Just go to johnanderson1000hands.com and it's all there. <laughs> I'm going to be doing um, Starship Trooper, which I haven't done for a while, and uh, you know some very interesting uh, songs, uh, very yes songs, and uh, what are we doing? What are we doing? I can't remember why. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, yours is Notice Grace. You know, songs I haven't done for a while. And uh, it's going to be a great, we're going to do a, you won't believe this, we're going to do a couple of Elias songs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I went to uh, the studio about six months ago, we're just doing some developing of some new songs, and uh, we were just messing around, and uh, it was... Michael Franklin came with the ukulele and started playing the song uh, from Elias and, and the bass player started joining in and I, we sang it like a trio and I said, this is part of the show, you know, it was uh, the flight of the Morglade. Yes. It's fantastic, you know. Well, for years there have been rumors that there was going to be an Elias too. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, that's... Um, a deep, a deep situation, but um, happily, and, and I can tell you this, um, I've been working on it for 10 years on and off, and uh, working with uh, some wonderful people, especially uh, a guy, and I can't remember his name now, now of course, and uh, we've done quite a lot of music together with the project, and uh, there's a couple of videos out there of it, and uh, Heed is his last name. Uh, Max Heed, I think. <laughs> I, I can't remember his name. Max Heed. We'll call him Max Heed. Beautiful guy. <clears throat> but it became it became one of these things, and I'll be very honest. It became like uh, like a, a, a gigantic uh, jigsaw puzzle. 
how to express the information that was coming through about the, the, the planet, how the planet evolved, and uh, who helped the planet to evolve before humans came into this world, and how it was done through music, because everything is music, everything is done through music. When I say music, it's vibrations of all different levels. And so you get into a sort of quasi sort of, uh, I don't want to go scientific on it, you know, I want to really conjure it up so it actually relates. So I must have written it a, the story about five times already and I'm still not uh, as clear as I want to be. But then something happened about a month ago. You remember the red moon? Yeah. Well, uh, a friend of mine, uh, my, my wife's sister's uh, friend who's psychic, she said, if you get your ducks in a row, the, the red moon, the wolf moon, the red moon is coming and everything will be achievable. And I thought, okay, Sam ran. <laughs> and, and I wrote down about a dozen things that I need to get done, you know. <laughs> and lo and behold, I got phone calls from different people and especially one guy who lives here in uh, New York who didn't really know so much about Zamran, but he asked me to sing on a song for him for his video game. And I've written a video game called How to Zamran years ago. So we're going to meet tomorrow for the first time because he's going to help me create the video game. And uh, I believe all these things are going to come to fruition. All my dreams are going to come through in the next 30 years because I... <laughs> hey, I'm not going anywhere. You know? It's true. Talking about uh, contemporary music, um, were you surprised when uh, Kanye sampled you? Oh gosh, yeah. Couldn't get much higher, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically that, really, really, yeah. 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 Um, I heard you tell a story that, uh, in this sort of R&B mode too, that somehow some of your work had influenced Michael Jackson on Thriller. Yeah, it became pretty well known that um, when uh, we released the album, uh, Friends of Mr. Cairo, I said to Van Gelis, you know the hit record on this is State of Independence, and he said, I don't think so, John. Uh, it's good. I like it, but it's, it's not. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I said, hey, what do I know? <laughs> what do I know? He just written the, the music for... Um, da, 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 da. Yeah. He, he came to me and said, John, I want you to sing this song. And he played me the music. I said, there's no room. It's so beautiful. But I, wrote, I actually wrote some lyrics, but it never got it done. So, the idea is, what was I talking about? <laughs> Moonwalking, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, friends of Mr. Cairo, a friend of mine, uh, Lee Abrams, who uh, loved the album very much, he sent the album to um, that guy who... Quincy. Quincy, thank you so much. <laughs> to Quincy Jones. And, lo and behold, Donna Summers recorded it, and Quincy sent Vangelis a photograph. He didn't send it to me. He sent, <laughs> sent it to Vangelis of who sang on it. And who sang on that song was uh, unbelievable. Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, everybody. You can imagine Diana Ross, about 12 of the greatest singers, you know, singing on a song that I helped to write. You know, it was like, it blew my mind. And, uh, and then I met Quincy about many, many years later, and he came over and he hugged me, John, I gotta tell you something. You know, me and Michael, we, we listened to that album over and over again when we were doing Thriller. And if you listen to that bass line of the, 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 the Billy Jean, is all, it's the same bass line, you know? I said, well, it's, it's called cross-pollinization, because <laughs> I'm sure. That's okay, no. <clears throat> Everything comes from everything, so it's no problem. I felt very grateful because the night that they sang that song, State of Independence, uh, Steve Wonder, Michael Jackson, Quincy, and the other guy, 
They wrote, we are the world. Yeah. Lionel. Lionel. Well done, Lionel. <laughs> Lionel Richie. That's what they did. That evening they started writing, we are the world. So in some form or another, that song, State of Independence, you know, opened up a sort of mental avenue there. And that's what they did. It's very cool. So um, I'd like to open it up to the audience and take a, a, a couple of questions. And, uh, but no. I also, <laughs> we've heard bits of 1,000 Hands. I, I, th I think we've neglected to tell the people that, that it's coming out March 31st, 31st right? yeah. Okay, and you can do an advance order on... Uh, yeah, pre-order, you go to johnanderson1000hands.com, pre-order it, and you get a vinyl or a CD or a blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Down streaming. Implant. <laughs> That's the next thing. That's going to be the next thing. You get an implant, you don't even have to go to Amazon. You just... <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you've, you've got an implant already. You don't really know how good it is. If you ever think of a song... Think of a song like Somewhere Over the Rainbow. If you just sit quietly, you can hear the damn thing. So the implant is work. Well, it's not an implant. It's a natural event. Your brain can actually... Anyway, yes, song. You can just say, I want to hear your move. <laughs> Take a straight and strong. This is really good. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm going to bring the mic around. So. Mm. Well, let's, we're going to start over here. Okay, how you doing? Hi, how are you? Very good. Would you mind talking about I get up, I get down from close to the edge, what inspired you, what those lyrics meant? It's uh, one of my favorite songs. Interesting. The, the song, it was that time where me and Steve were so close, like musical brothers like I've never had since. We were so tight making that song, making that, uh, that track, that um, he started, there was, uh, again, a section where we got to the certain point in the song or do, do you go back to the beginning, or do you go back to a, a, a new bridge? Or, I said, you go into an ocean. And they said, what's that, John? We go into an ocean of sound, because at the beginning of the song, I'm going to create an ocean of sound that brings in the beginning of the song, and it's going to come in in the middle, and it's just going to be an ocean of so sound and stuff like that. Because I've been listening to Walter Carlos, uh, Sonic Seasoning, brilliant album. And it's like, thank you. And uh, so, right in the middle, it'll be just this dun, 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 dun the keyboard, probably Rick on the keyboard, and then we're going to go into the song, uh, two million people barely satisfy, 200 women watch one woman cry. And these were the chords of Steve that played to me, and I said, this is, yeah, this is the song. Keep playing those chords, Steve, please, please. And, and I, I sang the song, and we just recorded it, and I just sang it. I get up, I get down. And I just sang it, and, and I said, that's it. And then a, about two days later, uh, Steve was playing the chords and singing, in her white lace. I said, Steve, what are you doing? Well, the, the chords are from a song I wrote. I said, well, sing it. And he said, in her white lace, you could clearly see the lady. And I started singing, and it, it, it fit together, together like a glove. It was like magic, you know? Because it, it, it just happened, you know? And I, I kind of freaked out a little bit that two songs would just sit together like that so much, so easily. Very powerful. All right, we got one on the other side over here. Over here, guys. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hey, John. Yeah. I have a message for oh, you from careful. Michael Samus. Oh, Michael. Good. He sends his regards to you. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. I'd like you to talk about the album Angels Embrace. Okay. Which is one of my favorite records. Okay. You, you called me one night while you were having dinner with Mike. Okay. And we had a nice conversation. My name is Mercury. Hey, rising. <laughs> <laughs> you turn the lights down a bit or something? It's like I see people. Um, yeah, um, Angel's Embrace was more a question of, I, I constantly re re record music of all different kinds. It's a, 
a natural event that I just make music every day. And then I'll listen to it and think, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, or where did this kind of music come from? And the Angels Embrace uh, period was to make something that was very gentle and very, uh, you can, it, I used to call it natural, <laughs> sorry, sleeping pills. <laughs> It'll send you to sleep. <laughs> it's so clear and everything. It's like a very good way of going to sleep. And that's what, you know, you can play it to the kids. They'll go to sleep, you know. <laughs> that's what I used to say, you know. And uh, I just remember just putting the, the certain pieces of music together that seemed to get into that sort of uh, very relaxation sort of piece of music. And a lot of people have actually written to me saying, you know, how much it's really helped them through, um, you know, we go through so much, you know, in our usual human experiences. And sometimes um, it's good to have music that will calm you down. And, uh, I know that uh, when I listen to Sibelius, I just go into a deep, beautiful place, you know. And uh, so that was all about Angel's Embrace. Thank you. I'm going to go over here. Right in the middle here. Did you have a question? Hi there. Hi. Hi there. John. Um, I just want you to know how proud I am of you. Thank you. And, <clears throat> yeah, very proud of you. And me of you. For being here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I've been ordered to ask you, <laughs> what's, what's happening with ARW? Are you going to be working with them again? Because they were awesome. You were awesome with them. Yeah. You don't have to. I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah. We just went through a period together that we were very happening on stage. But everything that surrounded us wasn't as clear or well-defined as it should be. When you're on the road, you're expecting to be... Uh, sort of well-organized, everything well-organized, and it just wasn't as clear for us, the three of us, where we were heading. And I personally always wanted to just make some new music, but it was just hard to get everything in that sort of area where we were connected. And uh, that's just the way things are. And I just said, I'll see you in 2020, maybe 21, or so we'll get together. Because I'm a big, big fan of uh, both the guys. Uh, you know, the music that Trevor does is, is ridiculous. It's so beautiful. His, work, his, work, his stores, his music that he does for movies and everything. He's a consummate artist. And Rick is a wild and crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> but Rick, unbelievably, you know, he might be a little bit out there sometimes and here and there. Man, when he's on stage, he is a magician. Very rare, you know, very rare, beautiful. Very powerful. So we'll see what happens. We got time for one more? I can, many more, please. <laughs> I think we're gonna go right here. No, no, you, I said no. John? <laughs> en enough already. <laughs> Not yet, you haven't got the microphone. <laughs> John, I have one question about tails. Please. Which I love and I appreciate. Thank you, thank you. Why oceans? You can explain that. I just think it sounded good when I said tales from topographic <laughs> oceans. Um, I think uh, topography just struck me very, very strong that we don't know very much about the ocean. And uh, we know probably about 10% of the ocean. We've got no concept of what's going on in the ocean and what the ocean, and we are actually from the ocean. You know, physically say, saying, that's where, that's where we come from. You know, we are so connected to the ocean. So it was, a, it was a balance of tales from topographic oceans. I saw that tour, and I have to say, the set design was really incredible. That, that was Roger Dean and his brother. Yeah, yes. I mean, the lighting and everything yeah. Yeah. fit the mood so incredibly well. Wow. Yeah. So, John, Please, thank you more. so much. More. More? Okay. I don't, we'll keep going. <laughs> I think, All right, one more right here. One second. One, one second. more right here. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> We, we call him super fan, this guy, super fan. We're, we're trying to build up a little uh, anticipation, well, attention. I've got to sing in a minute. I don't know if I can sing, actually, but I'll try. John, great. John, I've loved you since 1973. Thank you for all your music. Thank you. Quick question. You never did cover, or you hardly ever did covers of other people's songs. 
but you did America by Simon and Garfunkel. What ever made you do that? Because it's one of the greatest things. He's you yesified the, it beautifully. It's just one of the greatest songs. We're actually going to do it on this tour. Really? Right. It's, nice. It's Paul Simon. Paul Simon is your king here in America. He's, he's the man. He's the, the greatest songwriter ever, you know. And so many good ones, but uh, Paul Simon is very special in my life. And... Uh, Whenever I sing that song, I feel like, because I'm, I'm an American citizen, you know, for 10 years. So I want to sing that song. I really do. Wasn't there, I, I, you know, this? I heard an anecdote that, like, when you first started, yes, sort of part of an idea was to incorporate Simon and Garfunkel type harmonies into. A, True. A, the first thing we spoke about was um, The Boxer and uh, that album was. Uh, me and Chris talked about it all night, actually, and then just realized that a band playing really tight, sort of progressive wasn't the right word anyway. It was a music that's very, very interesting, exciting, with really good vocals. Because there was a lot of great, great bands with a singer singing away. But here we could have a three-part harmony and, you know, add vocals here. We've got it. You know, that's, that's Chris, really. Very, very good. All right, we got one more. Hey. One more. Yeah, there we go. The guys, uh, who wasn't here that really wanted to ask? No, he, he, he doesn't need a microphone. He, he doesn't. Super fan. Super fan. Very quietly, please. John, welcome to New York. Thank you. 2019. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And I want to talk about the fans because you've created all these fans who love the music, but we've been blessed to hang out with each other. True, true. People of us yeah. who have met. Malcolm's here. Now Malcolm's God, here. God, Malcolm, we love Malcolm's Malcolm. here now. And I want you to know, God John, him. that is a very, very important part of our life. Yeah. And the Yes fans are the greatest fans in the world. I agree. And what do you think? What do you Thank think? You. Well spoken. <laughs> well spoken. I really believe that. What? Yeah. So what <laughs> no. <laughs> we got one more question over as here. I, as I said, I've said before, without you guys, we wouldn't be going what we're doing, what we do without you guys. We are, we are nothing without fans. We are nothing, honestly. And I, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There you are, there you are, there you are. <laughs> all right, we got one more question of all the way over here on the side. Last question, I think. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Hey, John, it's Sal. How you doing? Sal, how you doing, man? Good. You talk with such admiration about some of the artists that are on this album, and you, you mentioned Ian Anderson, Billy Cobham, Paul Simon, his songwriting. You're also known for working with so many unknowns through your work with the Internet. But I want to take it back. If you could work with one or two established artists, whether people that have influenced you or people you admire, who would that be and, and why? Nina Simone. <laughs> Nina Simone, for me, was the, the greatest. And she's just been inducted to the Hall of Fame. I thought she was already in the Hall of Fame. And she just got in now. And uh, her songwriting, her, her spiritual energy, her power, don't mess with, I wouldn't say, don't fuck with me, but I would say, <laughs> don't mess with me, Nina, Nina Simone, the great Nina Simone. And uh, Marvin Gaye, of course, and what's going on. I wish I'd have been there at that session when they did what's going on, because the story behind that, you know, God bless him, because uh, they wouldn't release that album. They didn't think it was commercial for 18 months, 18 months. Marvin just sat around saying, I think it's a very good album, man. What's the matter with it? But they didn't release it for 18 months. I would, no wonder he went a bit crazy. You know? But there's been obviously great artists uh, throughout my life that uh, I've, I would always love to sing with. And uh, in fact, um, I was talking to my friend about doing that, um, the idea that I could get Hoggy Carmichael footage of him singing, and I will, I will look like I'm in that exact same place, standing at the piano, and I'll sing with him, you know, something like that. 
and sing with Nina Simone, you know, and, and be in the same sort of vibe that I'm actually, it looks like I'm in the same room. Whether it'll happen, I don't know, but that's what I started thinking last week. It'd be kind of cool. I would say, Sorry? Hang, hang on one second. Um, so, um, yeah. I was speaking to a, a, a friend of mine who knows Robert Fripp. Oh, Bob, yeah. Yes. And uh, Bob said that uh, you're a sucker for a show tune. Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course. You know. No, it's true. I, I, we were actually today at uh, Oscar Amerstein's uh, incredible building down, down there, somewhere down there. <laughs> Gigantic building, big, big, beautiful uh, uh, sort of um, theater, big theater with up-to-date uh, modern technology to film and record. And what, I want to do a show there with this band and bring in all the people, not all the people, but a lot of the people did uh, worked on the album and do a special event there. And because Rogers and Amerstein, their songs, I grew up with them. You know, I just love them. I love show songs. I just adore them, you know? Oklahoma. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, the, the great story is that, 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 uh, that show, Oklahoma, was a flop. It was a flop. And they hadn't put that song in. So they went away and they came back. Same show, just one more song. And that song made it a monster hit. So one song can make it happen, like uh, Rama Lama, or maybe <laughs> makes me happy, or I mean, you know. You never know. You never know. Well, John, I'd like to thank you for being so thank generous you. with thank your you. time. Thank you. Let's hear it for John. His new record, A Thousand Hands, out March 31st. We're going to take a bit of a break, and then John's going to come back and play a couple of songs for us. And again, thank you all. I will try my best. I will try.
One, two, one, two. The guitar. Thank you. I'll spend the next 15 minutes tuning up and maybe I'll sit down. Microphone in the monitor, please. My microphone in the monitor, and uh, that's good. Thank you. Not too loud. Okay. Pretend it's a gig. Okay. So, what's the difference between a guy who falls from? The <laughs> oh yeah. Move yourself. What I can't remember the words. You always live your life. Okay. 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 Yeah, play sing along. Move yourself. You always live your life, never thinking of the future. Prove yourself. You are the move you make. Take your chances, win or lose. Be yourself. You're every step you take. You and you, and that's the only way. Shake, shake yourself, your every move you make. So the story goes on a rather lonely heart. On a rather lonely heart, much better than on a rather broken heart. On a rather lonely heart. Say you don't want to chance it. You've been hurt so before. Watch it now, the eagle in the sky, how it dancing one and only. You lose yourself, no, not for pity's sake, there's no real reason to be lonely. Be yourself, your every move you make, you got to wait to succeed. On a rather lonely heart, come on. On a rather lonely heart, much better than on a rather broken heart. On a rather lonely heart. On a rather lonely heart. After my own indecision, they confuse me so. My love's a no love question at all. In the end, you gotta go. Look before you leave. And don't you hesitate at all, no, no.
Okay, so I'll just do one more. And uh, <laughs> I wish, you know. No, no, no. So all, all I need you to do, just sing along, just to help. Take a straight and stronger course to the corner of your life. Make the white queen run so fast She hasn't got time to make you wild Cause it's time, it's time and time With your time and his news is captured For the queen to use Move me on to any black square Use me anytime you want Just remember that the goal Is for us all to capture all we want Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't surround yourself with yourself Move on by two squares Send that instant karma to me Hit a shilling with love and care for yourself Cause it's time, it's time and time with your time and his news is captured for the queen to use It's time, it's time and time with your time and his news is captured. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for John Anderson. Come on. 1,000 hands coming out March 31st. Thank you so much, John.